Russia is tearing itself away from modern civilization and its associated values, norms, and comforts. Putin and his coterie of incompetent sycophants seem to be happily destroying the foundations of everything that has been built in the last 30 years. Instead, he's embracing an alternative future tied to Eastern despotism as a vassal state of China, a source of assets to be mined without any value-added production. What demons have resurfaced from Russia's past, and what is driving a form of sadomasochistic self-destruction and flagellation that seems to be propelling Russia backwards in a painful civilizational decline? And where would this out-of-control troika stop? Possibly at an era that predates Peter the Great's efforts to punch a window onto Europe in the facade of Russia's feudal military despotism established by the Khans of the Moscow of the Mongol horde. But what is the role of such a state in the modern world? Welcome to Silicon Curtain. All our content is also available on popular podcasting platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please like and subscribe to help new people find our fantastic speakers. And of course, if you enjoy the content, consider supporting us by becoming a patron. Alexander Etkin is an historian and cultural scientist. Alexander was born in 1955 in St. Petersburg, Russia, and is a professor of history and the chair of Russia-Europe relations at the European University Institute in Florence. He is a fellow of the European Institute for International Law and International Relations. He completed his BA and MA in 1978 in psychology and English at Leningrad State University. Etkin taught, uh, taught at the European University at St. Petersburg, then at Cambridge University, where he was also a fellow of King's College. He was a visiting fellow at New York University, Wissenschaft College in Berlin, and other places too. Etkin's research focuses on European and Russian intellectual history, memory studies, natural resources, and the history of political economy, empire, and colonies in Europe. And, of course, Russian politics, novels and film in the 21st century. He's written many compelling books, including Russia Against Modernity, Rethinking the Gulag, and Nature's Evil, A Cultural History of Natural Resources. And, of course, we're going to put links to some of his articles uh, and uh, to these books in the description. And I very much encourage you to seek them out. Alexander, welcome to the channel. I, that was a long introduction, in fact. I hope I got that accurate, but if anything wasn't quite accurate, do please uh, correct it now. Yeah, it was uh, very flattering, but not uh, entirely accurate because I have changed my uh, job this summer. So I am I am professor of the Central European University in Vienna. Um, and I also want to mention from the very start my forthcoming book, Russia Against Modernity which should be released uh, in March or April by Polity Press in Cambridge. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to reading that, uh, you know, having uh, dived into your book on the role of assets and resources in history, uh, which I find absolutely fascinating. I'm going to touch on that, but we're also going to examine some of the themes in your forthcoming book. Uh, and I think that hopefully will encourage people to to check it out. And one of the more interesting ideas there, uh, of course, is that Russia's recent direction over the last decade, over the last decade, is in the opposite direction to many sort of modernist trends that you can see in the West. Yeah, that's true, and uh, it's, that's sort of different also from the general course of Russian history, because uh, what what was what, what was more um, common uh, or traditional. Uh, was uh, sort of uh, catching up with the Western development with some gap or, you know, which also provided very good and sometimes great conditions for Russian arts and uh, sciences and uh, the Enlightenment in general. Uh, they could uh, develop in this kind of glo uh, gl glass house. Um, uh, you know, created by GAP and by the sponsorship of the government and the interest of the enlightened public uh, in competition, uh, usually some, some, somewhat behind uh, the West. But it has really changed 
uh, throughout the 20th century uh, due to this great or not so great socialist experiment, definitely failed experiment. Uh, and but um, uh, what has happened afterwards? What happened after the failure of this uh, Soviet experiment seems to be even worse. There was so much hope from within and from the outside that that would kind of redeem Russia and um, give a new, new opportunities. And uh, it worked for a while. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. And the situation is uh, worsening uh, with every day as we see it. Would you make a distinction between the first half of Putin's regime where there seems to be a concerted effort to try and catch up with at least some aspects of consumerism, maybe the more sort of superficial aspects of it, um, and the latter part of his regime, the sort of post balotnaya uh, more authoritarian tendency? Right, that that was a clear break, which you have marked uh, very precisely. post balotnaya means like after 2012, the mass protests uh, in Moscow, when the sort of intellectuals and IT workers and uh, you know relatively enlightened Moscovites went to the streets protesting against all kinds of political manipulations and uh, um, and um, just f f f fake votes and uh, forged elections, and uh, the protests were suppressed. And something had uh, changed, indeed, at that point. But uh, but in fact, you know, the, having a, a former KGB officer in the, the in, in the top of the government, it's not, it's not that unique in uh, Western history, to be sure. But um, I I had you know bad feelings from basically two thousand one or two thousand. I I, I uh, emigrated from uh, Russia from Saint Petersburg in two thousand four. I felt that it was just I got a position at Cambridge and uh, I was like a gastarbeiter at that point. But uh, with uh, you know, as the years were passing by, uh, I really felt myself more and more as a political emigre, which is very much how I feeling myself now. Mm. And that, of course, you know, there there was a wave of people, um, not a huge wave, but there was a wave of people who uh, felt in 2014 with the invasion of Crimea that there was a further lurch um, towards a sort of political environment. But most people made their peace. They carried on working. They uh, perhaps withdrew from politics, or maybe not that many were involved in politics. And, 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 and they went along with the sort of social contract, which is you try and earn money, you get by, but, but don't get involved in politics. That, of course, is out of all proportion to the estimated million or so people who have now fled since the announcement of conscription. So you've been living with the senses of exile for a long time, um, but you're now potentially joined by by many hundreds of thousands of others. Yeah, that, that's, all, that's, all, that's all correct. Um, I'm not sure about that uh, co contract that you describe. Uh, to me, so looking backward, that was more like a sort of schizophrenia, kind of political um, division, uh, a kind of di di dissection of the society into two parts, one of which would be uh, kept safe, uh, uh, wealthy and ignorant about the war or occupation of the Crimea or the current war in Ukraine or the, the, the previous war in Syria. But all this geopolitical, very tricky, hugely expensive, of course, and very insecure um, political and military experiments that uh, the regime has been um, in, you know, accomplishing or kind of endeavoring for, yes, probably decades now. So, well, so that, but that was uh, somewhere abroad, uh, somewhere on the margin, some somewhere on the periphery of the this fragile um, post-imperial, still very very imperial state, which is called uh, the Russian Federation. But the centers, like Moscow, Saint Petersburg, several other cities, were kept out of it. So there was a concerted effort to keep their salaries, you know, high and maybe growing, you know, 
introducing all kinds of new financial services like mortgage mortgages for you know people could buy the new apartments and cars and all that and as long as there were there was money in the state coffers and this money obviously were created not by the labor of all these people but by natural resources that were traded mostly in europe so as long as there was money this kind of schizophrenic politics was a success and you know so you've got the middle class there or the proto middle class that is being kept sort of uh isolated from the real issues and sort of satisfied inverted commas but you also have the sylvia key class you have the huge layer of whether it be sort of secret state whether it be rusko guardia whoever you've got a, a sort of military uh sort of secret service layer which must be incredibly expensive to maintain you know on top of the military industrial complex on top of these middle class demands that you're you're talking about there um what happens when the margin on russia's natural resources reduces as we're seeing now the world prices of these uh, resources goes down it's not at the peak it was at uh, sort of putin's um when he really benefited from that um and at the same time the costs of extraction are going up as well because of its sanctions uh, of course russia's equipment which is largely supplied by the west is going to start sort of breaking down and becoming less efficient you know is this is this a machine living on borrowed time it is very much so, and you are perfectly right in your analysis. I would just add cost of extraction are going up, but also cost of transportation. They are huge, and all this idea that the, this Russian oil and gas and metals uh, could be actually traded uh, to, to the east, sold to the east rather than to the west, it uh, takes you know, huge expenditures, you know, re redirecting uh this trade uh you know you, they, 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 are, they are talking in the kremlin about uh, building new pipelines this called the force of siberia that would basically go all across siberia to china uh they, they will never do it that's just impossible which technically also financially uh geographically impossible so that that actually means that a big a bulk big part of this gas will never be traded at all uh, and as about oil this oil could be could, could go uh, around the world uh, you know through the suits or around africa by tankers but of course these tankers the, so the transportation costs have, have, have increased maybe by 20 or 30 percent and then there is this cap on the price of oil uh on the uh, uh on on the destination point so this capture also uh, takes into account this transportation costs uh it makes uh, all this trade that uh, trade in in uh, fossil fuel which was fabulously profitable for russia through decades increasingly questionable and of and... course it also, it also is taking place on the background of our climate crisis and you know decarbonization plans this net zero to 2050 in europe which has been announced officially and other you know it was confirmed many times even during the war and net zero means actually zero purchases of russian carbon fuel and this war that putin is conducting seems to have no real economic benefit you know people have talked about you know access to the black sea and grain etc cetera, etc cetera. but when you put that in relation to the revenues being earned from gas and oil um and those constricted margins now because of sanctions would you agree that there's very little economic sense in putin's actions um never mind the sort of you know the value uh share value of companies factories etc which is burning up um because of sanctions are we seeing a war that is much more driven by um political reasons and i think in some of your commentary you've even labeled it as fetishistic uh you know the pursuit of places like crimea and donbass they don't have strategic sense there's something else driving this impulse yeah, exactly. They have no economic significance whatsoever, particularly now that they are fully destroyed. 
because you know the uh, Ukraine is a very, very rich, uh, potentially very wealthy and prosperous country, but its wealth mostly depends on the labor of the Ukrainian people rather than natural resources, you know, uh, in in the earth, underground, um, and whatever was whatever whatever was. Uh, available there coal metals uh, huge metallurgic plants uh, close to the mines have, have been entirely destroyed and in the current context which also means climate crisis and um energy transition uh, this coal, coal mining and metallurgic uh, plants will never be uh, Rebuilt. There is just no way to for rebuilding them. Um, the uh, Ukrainian nature has, has hugely has been hugely pol polluted by uh, by the war. There are mines in the field. All this lead, or the contemporary weapons uh, like bullets, shells, mines, bombs, they consist mostly of lead. So after they, if they don't explode, like mines or bombs. That's a huge danger. But after they explode, they leave tons and tons of toxic lead in the soil. All this land will, would have to be uh, you know, cleaned and whatever, filtered, dug, filtered, put on the place, back on the place. That will take decades for Ukrainians to do it. And you're talking about the poisoning of land, waterways, all sorts of natural systems that uh, previously would have been, you know, generating quite a lot of wealth. I know Russian propaganda is going to be making a lot of depleted uranium, but that compared to the lead poisoning you're talking about is perhaps a bit of a, a sideshow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ukrainians actually are doing a great job uh, describing, depicting this damage to their nature on the top of the damage to... To human beings, which is of course uh, cannot be evaluated at all, but they they evaluated the damage to nature also in many many billions of dollars because it will take that much and definitely more to to restore the landscape. And in your book on you know, combining sort of politics and the nature of political regimes with raw materials and resources. It's always struck me the contrast between, say, Finland and uh, Russia, where Finland and to an extent the Baltics didn't have much in the way of sort of natural resources, so have had to be relatively inventive in their economy, make the most of uh, the sort of uh, quite a harsh environment and meager resources. Um, how far do you think Russia's regime and and you know, a manifestation like Putin, how far does that come from the fact that, you know, Russia is, you know, you could loosely term it a sort of petro tyranny? Um, or is the dynamic of trying to keep a fragile empire together more important? Or do they combine together in a kind of toxic mixture? Yeah, probably the latter is the best conclusion because it is difficult to scale, you know, to, to weigh these two factors, the kind of post-imperial syndrome uh, on the one hand and the petrostate um, the oil curse primarily on the other hand. But having this together is a particularly dangerous toxic combination. And also a rare combination in the contemporary world, because most of the most of petro states, think about Saudi Arabia, you know, or or Norway, or uh, Brazil, or Nigeria, they are rather post-colonial rather than post-imperial. They are they are all form, former colonies, and they, that's entirely different uh, historical, social, and psychological. Uh, structure of sentiments and this uh sort of addiction or, or craving i think as you've called it in some of your articles to oil and of course to empire which you just covered here does this also help explain in some ways what we also see when we compare you know ukraine and russia and in, in ukraine you have quite a lot of value you know placed on the individual on the individual life on the sort of brains and abilities of an individual whereas you 
we seem to see from from Russia's rulers uh, a near contempt of the value of the individual. Um, can this also be related back to you know economics um, and this imperial tendency? Yes, indeed. Um, this is uh, this is very material. This kind of neg- neg- negligence or indifference to human life in at war, but also in peace. That that was the same in 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 the time of peace, which I didn't see that vividly, because war really mm-hmm. reveals the in, internal problems. Uh, any war does. Um, but it has this so, so this indifference that you mentioned does have kind of material economic foundations because the prosperity of the state did not come from the people from their labor creativity no knowledge uh, sociality ability to do things together uh, in kind of new uh, original attractive ways uh, all this pr- enormous prosperity came from natural resources, from you know holes in the in the dirt somewhere in the marshes of West Siberia, and uh, that's entirely different. It's it's not just economics. It's one could say that it's a political economy, but it's also political ecology. It's also geography, and uh, it's like a whole field of politics of natural resources, which is a, a, an amazingly rich and faithful field that has been quite neglected by political scientists of any breed. And of course, you've pointed out as well that the other aspect of it, which is especially pernicious, is that the bulk of those natural resources, uh, whether it be sort of heavy metals or hydrocarbons, does not come from areas which are ethnically Russian. So the extraction, the parasitism of, say, the Moscow elite, um, you know, requires this sort of imperial structure and the imperial brainwashing because, you know, these resources are not in ethnically Russian areas. That's definitely true. And uh, just look at uh, uh, oil, but also look at the budget of the Russian Federation. So the two districts um, of that are located in uh, West Siberia. Uh, and uh, one is called Hanty Mansi, another is called Yamalo Ninets. So that's the uh, names of the peoples that have been largely extinct, uh, which doesn't mean that they were necessarily killed or died, uh, died out. Many, many of these men and women change their names or change their kind of passport ethnicity. Uh, they, uh, they, they they became Russian at some point in, in the Soviet decades or late in the post-Soviet decades. They ch- chose it, um, more or less voluntarily, I guess. But uh, the, the fact is that the indigenous peoples that, according to an, almost any constitution of, the, of any modern state, own the uh, riches uh, underground, um, the treasures uh, of of the uh, land. Uh, they, they are fully alienated, fully kind of estranged, pushed out of you know uh, owning these uh, treasures. Uh, it's all, all kind of managed and drilled, managed, transported, and uh, budgeted by Moscow. So oil and gas from these two districts, you can imagine it as like two counties, even though they are uh, hugely big on the geographical map, but they are very, very much underpopulated. Basically, that's all marshes, there are reindeers, there are you know some hunters, and there are many oil men that also come from Western Russia over there. Um, and they uh, this oil create like uh, about a, a half of the Russian budget and all other millions and millions uh, of Russians. Russia is a big country with very pr- pretty large population. Uh, they also work, they serve each other, they provide services, they whatever they teach in the universities, the doctors work in the hospitals, barbers work in the barber shops. They all are earning their money, but the, the 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 coffers of the state are filled not by the taxes of these people, professors or barbers, but by the custom fees from the exported oil and gas. And that really 
changes the whole political, economic, and psychological uh, configuration of the country. And that wealth, I mean, obviously we'll come to corruption in a minute because a chunk of that wealth, of course, gets siphoned off by the elite. Uh, and we don't necessarily know the exact figures, but Putin takes a, a cut of that, uh, one would assume as well. But that wealth then typically doesn't trickle back down to those local communities, does it? I mean, we've seen uh, travelogues and and uh, videos of some of those towns in the areas you've mentioned. Um, and, you know, way back, I, I, I even traveled uh, around. And there's some of those towns, villages are in shocking conditions. Um, the incidence of, um, let's say, sort of plumbing and sanitation it, it can be very low in some of those rural communities. So, again, you've got a, a parasitic structure where the center, Moscow, siphons off most of that wealth and most of the trickle-down wealth, as you say, from services, et cetera, which uh, are then associated with that economic activity. Yeah, it, it does trickle, trickle down in Moscow, mainly in Moscow, but also there is still another level of um, parasitism, <laughs> which is called capital flight. So, so huge money, so they kind of uh, estimated in uh, way more than one trillion over the over Putin's decades have been exported legally or le or paralegally or entirely illegally from uh, Russia to Western countries, uh, mostly Europe, places like Switzerland or Italy, etc. On very much Germany. Some of this wealth went to America. Some of this wealth also went east to whatever Hong Kong or uh, or China. And uh, it, if it trickles down anywhere, meaning that it's you know some locals benefit from the treasures, that would build the locals of Miami or the locals of Nizza or the locals of Hong Kong. It does trickle down, but trickles down elsewhere. Yeah, not 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 to locals. Well, this, I mean, that's absolutely terrifying, obviously. And I was watching a video um, this morning, which I hadn't seen before, and it's it, it's quite related to this. And it's one of Nemtsov's um, very kind of insightful uh, sort of polemics on the state of Russia. And there, a couple of years ago, before his uh, assassination, he predicted that. Putin was taking the country in the direction of becoming a vassal of China, an asset mind basically be stripped. Um, and the Russia was turning into, you know, th th that it would have nothing to offer the world except raw natural resources, nothing on the sort of value add sort of production uh, that comes after, um, you know, the extraction of those resources. Is his is his prediction now coming to pass with uh, we see, you know, Xi's visit to, to Moscow this week? Yeah, it, this prediction, of course, is, has been made good largely because of these plans of redirecting uh, fossil trade to China and India. Uh, with the start of the war, have been um, very, very active, and uh, but but you know, it's the, the actual leap up uh, in purchasing oil, Russian oil. Uh, uh, was shown by India, not by China. So in China it also increased, but in in India, in India uh, increased these purchases uh, more than tenfold. Um, I think China actually has lots of freedom in uh, you know planning uh, and actually doing the sort of organizing the energies. It's an it's energy supply. There are there is LNG. There is uh, its own coal, there is its own nuclear, it's all been developing, there is, you know, huge growth of renewable uh, production of energy in China, but, you know, fully based on the local materials and local labor. So I think that China, yes, China, of course, will trade uh, with Russia for, that, so that's, you know, huge uh, border and traditional uh, ties but i but but china is not dependent on this trade whatsoever R R R R russia is dependent russia is trying to uh, impose uh, this new kinds of trade uh, onto china 
But I'm afraid that actually we are, t we are, see we 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 are seeing something else. We are seeing an um, entirely new picture. And uh, see, when he was leaving Russia, he, he told Putin, and we all we all saw it and read it that uh, these new things are have, have are happening right now. They have not happened during the last hundred years, um, and we are making it happen. And uh, people are guessing. What 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 did he mean? But I, I I'm afraid that all he also means the, the entirely new military situation in the Far East, because the Soviet Union and uh, the first years of the post-Soviet Russia they 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 organized this huge military um, presence on the Chinese border and uh, in the Pacific. And this is a very long border. And for instance, you probably saw today the photos of very old tanks that, ha that have been now transported from this border to Ukraine. But this, this transfer of military power was going on from the very start of the war in Ukraine in 2022 or before that. All these transports that we, have, we, we saw them for months and months, they were bringing the equipment, armor, and soldiers from the Far East, from the Chinese border, to Ukraine. And they were there on the Chinese border for a reason. And the reason was kind of detaining, you know, deterring, deterring China keeping a military balance between Russia and China on the eastern border. They are not there anymore. Most of them have perished already in Ukraine. Some others keep fighting also in Ukraine. So now it's up to the Chinese government to decide what to do. Would they want to retake those big territories of northern China that had been appropriated by the Russian Empire in the middle 19th century in the course of the opium wars that the British Empire in the most predatory way waged against China. The settlement that was called as the Peking Convention was uh, mediated by Russian diplomats it was Count Ignatiev, who the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, who mediated the whole arrangement. And in gratitude, and also because China was entirely kind of weak and uh, and worn after these two opium wars, the Russian Empire received huge uh, you know, territories of Manchuria, the Delta of Amur, and the Pacific Coast, uh, places where Vladivostok and Khabarovsk uh, you know, major, major Russian cities are placed, and also uh, Navy harbors uh, are placed now. So that, that's it. so that's up, up to see and his people or maybe his uh, successors, you know, whether they would like to apply Putin's logic about this kind of historical revenge and reappropriation of the lost lands, Putin Lord's logic that he applied to Ukraine, would they like to use the same logic in the uh, Russian East? Or they would create something new. In that respect, uh, it opens up a whole can of worms, doesn't it? Because is China sitting back watching Russia exhaust itself against Ukraine. To an extent, it's rumored that that is some of the thinking of Western military experts as well, that, you know, we're drip feeding armament into Ukraine to basically bleed out Russia's um, military capability. Um, what's also happened, of course, is that the mystique of Russian power, the mystique behind Russian military equipment has been completely exploded. I mean, it's it's been shown to be a sort of Potemkin facade of strength and competence, which, of course, the, the Chinese must have paid some attention to. So is Xi's visit the sort of 
uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop kind of phase of history, uh, a temporary alliance which could be suspended at any point uh, as Russia seeks, uh, uh, sorry, as China seeks sort of territorial expansion for its huge population and internal pressures. I, I foresee something like that to happen, like, you know, this huge unexpected turns of the political and military situation, um, which was, had been all triggered by Putin's uh, invasion of Ukraine, this all-out war, um, and would not have happened, or maybe would have would happen would have happened decades later. Otherwise, but I don't think I do. I, I think this idea of the Potemkin village, the the facade, uh, fake facade. I think it is too simple. What actually is going on is different. See, so so we saw these tanks going, the, the old-fashioned tanks of, of the 1950s, Russian tanks going by the Trans-Siberian Railway built in the 19th century, um, all the way to Ukraine today. So these tanks were actually dug along the whole Russian Chinese border and also part, parts of the Russian Mongolia border. They were dug into the into the dirt, uh, working like the like lo long term art art artillery positions. They were very well sort of positioned, very well kind of defended, and uh, they they had the supply of shells that was all created through the decades of the Soviet power that was maintained or the, allegedly that was maintained through the, the last decades. And they were prob probably, they would work where they were. They sort of, would they work against the, you know, fancy uh, modern Chinese uh, weapons? We don't know that, nobody knows. But they they, they were not just by some kind of thing, they were, they they would work. But being, being dug out, you know, kind of, <laughs> restored somehow and put on the uh, railway and sort of unloaded in Ukraine, there they will fail entirely. This is what we're seeing. Well, let's turn to another uh, aspect of the of the uh, the war, and that is the Western expectation. You've written quite eloquently about so-called Western experts and actually the shallowness of many of their uh, sort of critiques during the war. One of those positions that we hear over and over again in the Western media is the anticipation of some kind of revolution in Russia. Well, we also anticipate hearing Western liberalism come out of Russian oppositionists. And then sometimes we're horrified when, you know, they don't say the things we expect them to say. How hard is it for Russian oppositionists to take a uh, sort of decolonization point of view? Because that surely must go against you know, decades of brainwashing go against decades of sort of cultural values and mindset. And any oppositionist who who would put forward a, a view that, you know, the Russian empire needs to be sort of dismantled and transformed, that's not going to get much popular backing if there was ever to be a free and fair election in Russia. Yeah, that's, that's all true. And the current leaders of the opposition, they still, I think, of the Russian opposition, they mostly are, they are either abroad or in jail in Russia. Those who are in Russia, they're in jail. And some of them are, you know, fantastically brave uh, and gifted and heroic people. And But some other, you know, and, and most, of, most of them are still live in the previous era they can't, they still count on the democratic elections they want to come to power in kind of free united but democratic and democratic russia which i think will not uh, be there after the end of the war it will be like either parts of russia either russia will will sort of collapse or will be partitioned or will sort of uh, will uh, break into constituent parts, and then some. Some of these parts could is could indeed be democratic, but probably not all of them. They will be all very different. 
and so, some of our current op opposition is could you know continue their fight whatever in the uh, mo mo Moscow um, successor state or whatever in the Ural successor state. Uh, so they could be democratic over there. So I, I think that Russia will either sort of uh, split and then there is some hope for democratic development of, the, of, of, of certain parts. Uh, or will vanish. But how could it vanish? Obviously, there is no such uh, possibility. Uh, the territory will be there. Millions of people will be still there. This millions of some one million has fled, but all other, you know, one hundred plus millions, they are, they will always be there. So there's a great kind of restructuring, a great perestroika, a great re, 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 reconfiguration of the fu fundamental um, issue structures and values of this country, of this land, and these people are coming. And uh, I think the current opposition, yeah, is behind the curve. They don't see it happening. But also the Western pundits, and also most of the actual very, very, very um, highly trained Western ana, uh, anal, an, uh, analysts in, uh, you know, in, 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 in high quarters, they also don't see this coming. They all kind of see the, and the, so the, the horizon is like the restoration of the pre-war status quo. But this restoration has become unavailable. There is no way back. And they, they missed many of the big events of recent Russian history, didn't they? Most analysts failed to predict the sudden collapse of the Soviet Union. They failed to predict the democratization of the East and, you know, that letting go of Central and Eastern European Empire. They failed to predict the reemergence of the Siloviki and the merger of the security state with the mafia state. Even that, I think, is not that well understood. Um, until recently, Putin was still seen as a, a statesman in many quarters rather than the sort of KGB uh, mafia sort of thug, essentially, uh, the, 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 that he emerged uh, as. Um, and is it also yeah. not the case that, that you know, the, these this Sylvia Key, this FSB class are firmly entrenched they're extremely ruthless, and both, I think, Western pundits and Russian opposition underestimate uh, how difficult it'll be to root out, you know, that uh, that essentially that sort of class uh, of, of uh, sort of par parasitic class that's taken hold of Russia over many decades and really emerged very strongly during the Soviet period. Exactly, and they they failed the Western analysts and uh, and uh, scholars of Russia, and also, but also I should say also many scholars of Ukraine, international relations experts, all these experts, almost all of them have also failed to predict the all-out Putin's war in Ukraine. If you look at what people were, you know, writing in 2021, uh, there, there were very few voices who took the American and British intelligence seriously. So in, the intelligence services did their job very well, I think. Um, but, and they, a part of their job, and that was very new for all of us, was that they kind of made it openly they kind of they pu pu published even they publicized they promoted the public knowledge of their work because they felt that that would help ukraine and maybe it did help ukraine to some extent um but analysts uh kremlinologists of all kinds uh, also the diplomatic community i think uh, did not join the, that effort and that that that's a major failure of the kind of expertocracy uh 
this power of experts. So the exp experts will never have that much power after this war will end. And even if the intelligence was quite accurate, I think they got something horrifically wrong, and that was underestimating the ability of Ukraine to to resist, the ability of Ukraine to self-organize uh, in the way that we saw that it did and resist the Russian invasion. And then throughout this war, they've been extraordinarily innovative. They've been able to take the best of Western weaponry and techniques and convert them to fight a much larger and theoretically better supplied enemy. And even in the media now, you still see a continuous drive to presume that, you know, Russia can never change and never go away and to presume that Ukraine, you know, at best is going to get sort of stasis on the battlefield. It can never win, et cetera. You still get these kind of analyses which are based essentially on nothing uh, or, or even worse on total misreading of uh, the dynamics in Ukrainian society. That's all very true, uh, but it's also this this coin has two sides. Uh, one side is underestimating the Ukrainian power. Uh, that, uh, but all, uh, another side is overestimating Russian power. And uh, that I think that the second part was actually, you know, pl played a big role because analysts knew very little about Ukraine. Of course, the intelligence people, the military advisors, you know, they, they, they have collaborated with Ukraine, had collaborated at that point for years, and they knew pretty much about that. But no, it, but but Ukraine did have major problems with corruption, um, which were, which had been permanently emphasized. But of course, Russian problem with corruption and inefficiency of the state were much worse, and they were also revealed by say by Alexei Navalny and uh, his his uh, his his people very very narrow, narrow circle of people who managed to make a, this major breakthrough in our understanding in like in, in our global understanding of the Russian state how it works why it, and, and how, why why it does not work but the pundits once again and the experts did not take the, it seriously. So they sort of, okay, that, that, yes, everyone watched Navalny, show, the Navalny show, but they did not take it as seriously as it actually was. And all, only the war has proven the seriousness of the Navalny show. And to an extent, I, I wonder if you, uh, you um, what you think of this idea. I think Putin did take Maidan and the Ukrainian revolution seriously. I think he grossly misunderstood them and misinterpreted them but he did see them as very sort of powerful political technologies whereas i think in the west we tended to see maidan as more of a local phenomenon not a struggle of sort of um emerging democracy against the forces of uh you know authoritarianism but i think putin understood very well how dynamic and powerful and destructive uh the forces unleashed in ukraine could be if they were to, you know, be transitioned or transferred into the Russian context. Now, whether that was just paranoia, whether there was ever realistically going to be a Russian Maidan, I think nonetheless, he, he felt extremely threatened by what was happening in his, uh, you know, neighbor's country. He felt threatened, but, but I think not so much by this sort of idea of the... Um... Uh, export of Maidan to Russia. I think that uh, didn't go, like his imagination didn't go that far. Uh, it was, I think, diff different. You know, the Russian Federation did have lots of interests in Ukraine, whatever economic interest, all these pipelines that go, and they keep working despite all the bombing and all the you know, war efforts. And uh, the popular pipelines in the North Atlantic had been exploded by the unknown forces, while pipelines that go across Ukraine, they keep working and pumping Russian gas. And uh, the Gazprom is paying every month, you know, across the front line, the Gazprom is transferring these billions. That's, that's an amazing feature. 
of the conflict. You know, historians will have lots of fun, you know, uh, analyzing these events uh, retrospectively. Um, your turn. <laughs> I've only got sort of, well, I've got a million more questions, but I think we've only got time for for two more. Uh, and, you know, one of those relates to what we've been talking about, and this is resources. And then we'll we'll turn to sort of, you know, the future shape of, of, of Russia. But let me ask this one first. So when the money runs out or when there is not enough money to keep Chechnya, Puva, Kormi and the Siloviki class, you know, living in the standard to which they've become used to when that money starts to get thin on the ground what's going to happen i mean what does russian history tell us about an elite that can no longer pay its bodyguards essentially yeah that's an excellent question and uh, this is exactly you know the the core of the matter what we know about the Slaviki really is that they are they are very very cynical people they work for money, for good money. They to get this good money. We basically know their salaries. We know uh, the financial structures. We know the corruption levels. We know where this money comes from. That's the same, you know, pipeline going from West Siberia to basically to Germany, etc. Uh, Eastern Europe, and then bringing money back to Moscow. This, of course, has be, been thinner and thinner and thinner. And, uh, okay, so there is no hope that Siloviki will do what they are used to do, not being paid. But they, of course, they will be there. So they will do, do, they will still be doing something. And all these peoples that you mentioned and many more, uh, peoples of the Russian Federation, they will also try to survive because you know most of these regions districts and the so-called republics they they, uh, they 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 are fed by the transfers from moscow and these transfers this they are still the same petrodollars or gas euros that you know that uh, would would be transferred would be traded uh if there is not nothing like that so that will be either that there will be a chaos you know kind of war of all against all but i guess that there could be a better scenario and my hope is that the actual the the current elites and um, governments and political leaders of all these regions and uh, uh, and republics and districts uh they uh, they are kind of rudimentary. Their power ha has has been seriously decreased by Putin throughout these decades, but they are still there. There is like an, the, the, they have the cadres, they have the app, app, apparatuses, they have the borders. So the best scenario is that they will take power, and uh, using this you know apparatuses of power, they have their own Slaviki. They have some money of their own, though it is nothing to comp compare to the money of Moscow. So that's the best hope, that they will all claim independence and will start negotiating and trading among themselves. And also with the West and the East and the South as sort of uh, responsible actors of the new political arrangement. If that will fail to happen, if that will not be happen, that will be much, much worse. And of course, we know Putin's regime is built on uh, many mythologies. It's built on a sort of fetishistic attitude to the Second World War and the mythology that's created around that and, and many other sort of mythologizing of, of sort of history and, and, and uh, sort of Russia's evolution. There's also a focus, of course, on particular authors, particular aspects of Russian history, often to the detriment of, of other alternative narratives. Um, so very much in support of the more authoritarian statist uh, sort of attitudes. If, let's say, the state is too fragmented, you might get a sort of uh, uh, Muscovy, 
more aligned along its sort of historical core of several centuries ago. You have perhaps Northern Russia, perhaps more aligned with sort of Finland, Karelia, et cetera. Are there stories, narratives and mythologies that could be found in Russian history that could perhaps fuel new identities of these territories, post-imperial oh. identities? Uh, of course, uh, and uh, that will be all very diverse, and uh, but but invariably very rich. Tatarstan has its huge historical tradition, and uh, you know the language has that has been preserved, the literature, and the definite history, and of course re, uh, their own version of uh, the Islam religion, were relatively peaceful and sort of economically efficient. Uh, creed, and uh, there are other places like whatever the neighboring Bashkortostan, which is similar but different, and there are there are traditions in the Urals, and then there is Siberia, uh, <laughs> and um, even St. Petersburg. I mean, when I was there in the nineties, people were always at pains to say that they were different, and that so they did they distinguished themselves from the Bashar Derevnya, you know, the sort of Muscovite identity. Absolutely. St. Petersburg, of course, like you have to imagine St. Petersburg as a sort of an independent city. Uh, it would be entirely, you know, economically viable with all this, whatever, creative industries and universities, etc. And, uh, and re relatively uh, developed uh, uh care industries whatever hospitals that could be all kind of used in you know for domestic purposes for for uh, other you know parts of the former russia russian federation uh would be definitely supported by by this by scandinavia by germany um well-educated people you know quite disciplined quite sort of uh, quite quite capable um, but some other parts of the federation would not be able to rely on the labor of the people, but but they would have to to rely on their natural resources again. So there will be kind of the pipelines will be sort of re whatever re uh, appropriated by some some new uh, owners. But uh, they they would they would still work as you know as and uh, so pe people really kind of so. People really raise this question: How say how West Siberia will be trading its oil and gas? Because there will be they they have to go the, the pipelines will have to go through Moscow. So it it will go through Moscow as the Moscow pipelines now go through the hostile Ukraine. We have precedents. We see that it is possible, though difficult. They, they indeed they could explode at a time. And, you know, all this situation, it sounds like there are so many potential futures. Um, all of this, I'm guessing, hinges on whether Ukraine is victorious. If Ukraine is able to eject the Russian military from the entirety of its territory, including Crimea, is that the event that's going to set off a shockwave of change uh, within Russia? Yeah, that's... Uh, that, it, it will... Uh, but it also, you know, uh, we don't know where Ukraine will stop. Also, uh, you know, they're debating uh, Crimea, obviously, uh, but there, is, there, are, there are already voices that the Ukraine should go to not to the borders of 1999, but to the borders of 1919, uh, which were, you know, much larger borders. Uh, which will be will just mean a continuation of the war, uh, not nothing more than that. Uh, but of course, that will be a huge depletion of any kind of uh, material and human resources and financial resources in Russia. So the reverberations will be you know, huge. Um, but I should say that even if all that will not happen, and for some reasons Ukrainians will um, agree to some kind of unfair peace, forced by, and forced probably enforced by their Western allies, there is no, no other scenario that's plausible. This peace still will be, would be, after this war, 
the spears would be so shaky, so unstable, so the war would resume again at some point. So the whole, all, all that that we're talking about, it will, would be deferred. So kind of a, a premature peace would defer the new war. Mm. One can imagine that there will be no more, no revanchist would be more passionate than a Ukrainian revanchist after such a peace. Yes, it would create a, a sense of uh, loss and frustration on both sides, a sort of Weimar sense of uh, finger pointing blame. And uh, uh, we know what kind of terrible forces that that can unleash. Yes, yes, indeed. And it, it probably, you know, taking all this, you know, taking into account all this sacrifice and uh, all this, you know, genocide and uh, all this history of of this year of war that would also be considered as hugely unfair by the Ukrainians. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I think we've probably run out of time. I think that's a great place to end, um, uh, you know, the, the the need for perhaps a clean end to this war, but perhaps the unlikely uh the, the unlikelihood of that that sort of happening um there are a million other things i'm sure i could pick your brains about but for this interview we've run out of time alexander and i'm hugely grateful to you for sharing our insights and i think your thesis of of combining this sort of uh you know economic and, and material analysis uh with uh you know the identity of regimes and politics i think this is a an absolutely fascinating approach and so I'm going to enjoy reading your, your new book when it comes out. Thank you very much. That was a pleasure. And I, I hope that we will discuss my book when it comes out again. I would very much love to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.